So welcome to week nine of our History GCC revision. This is going to be the last uh, session on medicine. So we move on to Elizabethan. Okay, let's do this. So this week we're going to focus on the Western Front. So these are going to be the first questions that you'll be answering in the exam. And we'll look through some of these questions in the lessons. So these are the source-based questions. So the first question is a four marker. It's describe two features of. So it could be something like describe two features of the evacuation system, something like that. Uh, the next question is the sources. So they will normally give you two sources. One would be a photo or, or the other one could be like a letter from a doctor. Um, so how useful are they? And then you've got that strange 2B question, the follow up. How would you follow this up? question that kind of format we've done before so we'll look at those in the lessons so these are slightly different but i'm just going to give you a bit more background into medicine in the trenches so a little reminder is obviously you've got the no man's land at the front there you know soldiers were rotated so they'd spend about 15 percent of their time on the front line the firing line that's probably the maximum amount of time you could spend there before you go crazy and then they kind of rotate them backwards onto the support trench, the reserve trench, and then they'd spend time outside of the trenches. So, however, it's still pretty intense. Some of the key battles, just a few things to kind of note down. So this is this is going to be, um, you need to know this, in case, you know, if you want to get a really top mark on the sources. Um, so the, the second Battle of Ypres uh, was the first time they used chlorine gas, and the Germans used that. Obviously, we retaliated by using mustard gas. Uh, the next big battle, one of the biggest battles of the war, was the Somme. So the British kept on attacking, even though the weather was absolutely terrible. Uh, mud everywhere, so ridiculously high casualties, you know, 60,000, 70,000 people a day. A day. Uh, next one is Arras, and that's really famous for the British spent a huge amount, huge amount of time tunnelling underneath. Um, and the last battle there is the Battle of Cambrai, which was notable for the first use of tanks. Now, in terms of injuries and illness, in fact, uh, the majority of wounds were actually in the leg, which kind of makes sense because obviously shells were exploding. The shrapnel would obviously hit the kind of first kind of half meter of a human. So let me get the cursor. So obviously the shell would come in here, explode, you know, blow off your leg, your ankle, that kind of area. And literally after the first year of the war, the British Army introduced the Brody steel helmet, which did reduce uh, head injuries. Generally speaking, if you got hit in the torso, obviously in the main organ area of your body, you probably were going to die. So often those weren't even recorded, so they wouldn't even bother to kind of take you back. Um, so leg and arm injuries were the most common. And obviously the biggest problem was uh, infection because the bullet or shrapnel had kind of already gone through mud or whatever it had gone through and picked up infection or gone through your clothing or the uniform and kind of brought infection with it. Other problems were trench foot, standing in water, long periods of time, your blood circulation would stop. Also things like trench fever and lice and things like that. So lots of physical problems. There were unique problems with gas, obviously blindness, you know, burns on skin and all those kind of horrible things. Um, and that was really difficult for the doctors to deal with. And the one that wasn't really recognised at the time was shell shock for mental problems, you know, the constant shelling and all those types of things. So all in all, Pretty horrible. How are they going to deal with it? So the two groups that are kind of dealing with it are the, uh, the Royal Army Medical Corps. Um, you know, these are guys are still involved. So these are the kind of professionals, so to speak. So the doctors, the orderlies, the x-ray attendants, etc., etc. But there really weren't enough of them. So the first, uh, the nursing yeomanry, first aid nursing yeomanry were volunteers who came from the UK. And they volunteered to fight. On the trenches uh, and you know majority of those were women so without those women helping us i think there would have been a huge amount more casualties there was a famous underground hospital at arras which is like a deep cave where they had up to 700 beds um, so that was a famous example of how they could actually build hospitals if they had the right kind of uh, uh, areas to do that but it was just very very difficult because you know how can you transport casualties back from a mud muddy battlefield like that so they had to rely on stretcher bearers literally physically carrying them back 
um, before they could put them on some kind of ambulance. You know, further back, you know, they'll have trains, but most of those were being bombed or shelled. So the actual immediate 20, 30 miles behind the lines were really difficult to actually get them back, the casualties coming back. In terms of the chain of evacuation, um, what that kind of means is, you know, what, where do they have with you? Do they take you back? So our first area is the RAP, the regiment, Regimental Aid Post, and this is where you're giving basic first aid and the stretcher bearers will kind of be looking after you. You know, I do. They patch you up, keep you going. If they was really serious, they'd obviously rush you back quick, as quickly as they could. So the next stage was the dressing stations where they'd have some ambulances and some medical officers and nurses and they'd really sort of like try and go to work with you as quickly as they could. Um, if you're much more serious, they'd send you back to the CCS, the casualty clearing stations, had a lot better equipment. But often the doctors would prioritise people who were going to survive. You know, often people would get hit in the torso, you know, no chance of survival, they'd probably just leave them to die. Um, and they'd probably rush you back to the base hospital. So these are often on the uh, French and Belgian coast. So I've got quite a nice beer there. Um, the French and Belgian coast, they're near ports. And sometimes they'd have specialist doctors looking after gas injuries and things like that. So they had a pretty organised uh, evacuation system and a good system of triage in terms of assessing people. In terms of medical develops generally that kind of helped during this time, um, X-rays were big improvements. These are, these were invented way before the war, about 20 years before 1895, by this German guy who discovered he could take X-rays. But obviously, as you as you all know, it enables doctors to diagnose embedded objects like bullets. Um, the problems were it just took ages because the photography uh, technology was really poor, so it took absolutely ages. And obviously, if you've got a patient who's screaming in agony, it's quite difficult to get to do an X-ray these days, like two seconds. Um, the radiation is much higher dosage, so obviously that created problems. And some, sometimes, believe it or not, the patients actually lost their own hair in the process of doing x-rays. And they're incredibly heavy, so difficult to move around, and often generally were kind of behind the lines. The other, era, the other exciting error, I can't speak, the other exciting error of blood transfusions, and these are kind of strangely had happened many years before between animals and humans um and it's just scientists kind of messing around but most people died from that the first human to human transfusion took place in 1818 um but half the patients died and the problem with blood is obviously how can you store it you know one of the beauties of blood is it clots you know you cut yourself and within a few minutes you kind of set your finger or whatever and your blood will Will, will clot. So that is obviously the bonus of blood. However, how can you store blood if it keeps clotting? Um, a big advance happened in 1901-1902. So the re the re it's kind of made them realise why were so many people dying, half people dying in human transfusions, was because uh, you could only transfuse between the same group. So they actually managed to identify the four groups, A, A, B and O. Um, so that was a big improvement. Um, also, there was something called a septic surgery. So Joseph Lister had started this with antiseptics, and really by the 1900s, by the by, certainly by the start of World War One, it was general practice for wards to be cleaned and generally sterilised all over. Um, doctors wore masks and sterilised clothing, as we would know in modern medicine. This was obviously difficult in the trenches because of the amount of casualties and the conditions they were working under. So it's quite difficult to put that into practice. So. Obviously, World War One was absolutely terrible. You often find in wars that huge advancements do take place. So, one of the there's three areas. So, basically, one of the biggest problems was infections. You know, most soldiers were already infected by the time they even got anywhere near medical care. So, they came up with this kind of horrific, pretty gruesome picture. There, it was, this was called the Carol Dakin method. So, if the wound was infected, they'd kind of put tubes through the wound and they'd run sterilized salt into little holes in the tube there. But kind of blast the wound and get rid of it. Um, if it got really bad, really deep, they'd try and remove as much infected tissue as possible, and the ultimate um, solution was amputation. They're better to lose a leg than die. The other area is blood, blood transfusion, so again, this central issue of storage, and they realised in 1915 by using sodium citrate that would stop the clotting, and by using refrigeration they could keep blood for a few days, the next year, they discovered that citric glucose would keep 
the notes stored for up to three weeks. So this enabled them to, by 1917, literally have mud depots, as they called them, um, as we would know them, you know, like modern storage of blood that you can obviously use on soldiers who were injured. Other things that got developed during this time, so a big problem with kind of shell impacts and explosions was leg breaks and 80% of soldiers were being killed literally because, you know, imagine how painful it must be being carried through miles and miles of trenches, um, the blood loss and the shock and the pain. So they invented something called the Thomas Splint, you can see from the picture there, which basically kept the legs still, so that dramatically reduced the amount of uh, deaths. Plastic surgery, huge amount of horrific facial injuries and nose explosions, and Harold Gillies um, really developed this um, by grafting skin and making kinds of weird and wonderful things. Improvements there. And they also began to develop mobile x-ray units which were lighter and could kind of push near the front. Uh, so in terms of exam questions, they will have some kind of picture here. So this would be like, you know, describe two features of this. So it shows me that, um, you know, they had modern technology. It shows me that they could identify bullets and they could operate at the correct point. So we're going to look at more of this in the lesson because obviously we need all the sources and I can't really put that on PowerPoint now. Um, so we finish with this for now. We'll catch up with Elizabethan next week.